Hey, welcome back to another Backyard Professor Chess video. We are going through Bobby Fischer's tournament games. And he is beginning to come of age. We're up into 1957 now. Bobby's still a young player, still learning, still playing hard. Feuerstein and Fischer is the black. And once again, we see Fischer play the King's Indian defense. He played this a lot in his youth. He got it down really good. So let's see how they play this. He's going to mimic his opponent for a few moves in the opening. They both castle early. Always a good thing to do in chess. If you don't castle, you can get into trouble. It'll lead you cold. Now, it's 15 below zero right now outside. So Bobby's not going to leave us cold in this game by continuing to copycat. Here is the first change of pace. And his opponent opens strong with central possessing pawns. Fisher says, okay, let's put a little bit of pressure on the center. And then look. H3? That's kind of a dubious move, don't you think? Bobby says, okay, I'll take the pawn. And, of course, the knight is there to retake the pawn. And now Bobby comes up with an interesting move. He got an exclamation point on this one. Why? Because, let's see what happens He's going to push the D pawn. The C will take the D. And now the knight will take D5. And look at that beautiful pair of knights in the center of the board. Go Bobby. So his opponent will take the one. Of course, we saw that coming, right? I mean, it's inevitable. And now look at this post. Not a permanent outpost, but as I've said, knights need outposts. See, I told you, it's not a permanent outpost just yet. But now Bobby's going to go exploring. This is kind of interesting. What's going on? The queen is going to develop rather strongly on the queen side. And Bobby just simply says, I'm not afraid of the queen. I'm going to leave my knight deep in your territory. Very interesting move. His opponent has another trick to get rid of that knight. And Bobby says, nope, not going to happen. What you notice is Bobby has the initiative here. This is really interesting. He's calling the shots at this point. So queen a4, and now knight to d3. <laughs> and you're going, wow, we're talking a dancing knight here. Now, I, I know, you know, the rest of his board, yet he is fully developed. And I have said in previous videos of mine, it's very difficult to carry on an attack with just one piece. But Fisher is showing us, well, perhaps, yes, you can do that. Although it's really not doing a lot, it is sort of an interesting display of, hey, look what my knight can do. <laughs> so knight c3, and now look at this. Now, that makes you go, hmm, interesting. So he shattered the pawn side on the queen side. He's still got this open file. That has been a pretty decent coordination of a rook and a knight, hasn't it? So now you have to sit up and say, well, wow. So his opponent does. He says, I have had it with this. Let's get rid of that knight. 
Bobby says, okay, he's got the open file. It's been very useful. It could prove very useful some more. And now Rook A to C1. He's going to grab his own target on a file, not an open file. It's open for white. So this pawn, the isolated pawn, incidentally, becomes a target for white. You say, well, his own knight's in the way. That is irrelevant. There's your target. Don't, don't let stuff in between the rook and the target worry you at all. He'll find a way to, to develop that without question. And now here comes Bobby. And now you're realizing, oh, wait, uh, I've got to take the queen side seriously. Hold on. I just heard my heater turn up. Even though it's 15 below, I've got to turn that heater down. Otherwise, it's going to blow us out with noise. <clears throat> and I'm the one making all the noise. I don't need my heater to compete with me. It'll probably teach you better chess than I can anyway. So let's keep going here. Now, now this starts looking pretty interesting. And so the knight is going to come down to D1. And the rook is going to bump back up to B5. Bobby says, okay, let's see how I can do this a little bit differently. They're going to rearrange their pieces. Isn't that interesting? Queen in front of the rook hitting the pawn and rook in front of the queen owning the file. So the target is acquired, maybe not takeable just yet, but it is acquirable. Queen C2 and now rook B3. Why would he do that? Queen takes c6. The target. Yes, the target. And queen takes c6. And, of course, rook takes c6. And now they each have their own open file. So we see this. And rook will take a3, giving Bobby the lone pawn on the a file. Watch out. Interesting things can happen. However, this is quite an instructional game for this. That is worth, I'm going to, I'll tell you as we go along. Rook c7. Rook comes to d8. Ooh, what is going on here? Knight to e3. And now bishop to e3. D4. He's going to bring in the defender of the king here. Strong defender of the king and a Fianchetto's bishop. True. But now is the time. The board is relatively open and Bobby has targets. Right? So he's going to start hitting targets, bringing out the piece. There's no point. In leaving the bishop in a defensive position, guarding the king, if there's nothing attacking that king, the bishop is better useful out here. It's cool to see. So, bishop d4. Knight to d5. Nice outpost. Really? And you say, well, I mean, the, the bishop could exchange with the knight. That's right. White would want that. Because this board is really wide open, and he only has one bishop, Fisher has two. Is Fisher going to fall for this farce of an exchange? He actually does. <laughs> bishop takes the knight. Okay. The pawn takes the bishop, and the king comes to f8. Bobby is already going to start activating his king. The rook is going to come to acquire another target at the end of his open file, and he's got this open file. Fish, uh, Fisher has this target on his file, and Fisher has this past pawn. It's way back here, but there's no pawns to oppose it on either A or B file, so that's already a past pawn. Isn't that interesting? Technically, I suppose you wanted to wait until you pass the 
horizon line to call it a past pond, but there's nothing stopping that pond from marching in pond-wise. So by a royal definition, it's a past pawn. Rook will come to e1, and now Bobby comes bishop to f6, and that's just too passive. Doggone it, he starts playing passive a little bit here. Let's see if he can get with it. Now, here we go. Rook to a, or a5, pawn a5. Let's get going. Now, of course, he wants to avoid a back rank, although he wouldn't have a back rank mate. But let's tuck the king up there anyway at this point. And the rook will come to a1 to take over the eighth rank so the king has no escape. If he can trap the king down there, he can get a checkmate. And then notice, and this is one of the points of the game. This is really important because where do rooks belong? Behind past pawns. And now we see why. Because Bobby, without any other help, is not going to get that pawn in to queen because his rook's on the wrong side of it. Isn't that interesting? Rooks belong behind past pawns. Bobby's going to have to move his rook out to let that pawn pass, and that's when it's taken. That's why rooks belong behind past pawns. That cannot be overemphasized. That's a very important rule. Okay, so this is worth watching this game for how this develops. Very interesting. Bishop f3, rook d6, blockading the single Isolini, as Nimzovic would call it, the isolated pawn, now that it is properly blockaded, although uh, the rook, I mean, the bishop, yeah, the bishop can't get around to blockading him soon enough, so the rook has to do the job at this point. But uh, the rook shouldn't have to babysit the pawn. It would be better if the bishop would. Notice also something else. <clears throat> and unfortunately for this game, interestingly enough, uh, it's already looking draw-ish, isn't it? We have bishops of opposite colors. So what does that mean? That means we have bishops of opposite colors. <laughs> but it does say something of what you need to do. You need to keep your rooks dynamic and active. Unfortunately, Bobby has put himself in a defensive position on this pawn. And he's way down here, not being able to do anything useful. And interestingly enough, his other partner is stuck blockading a pawn. So he's basically just playing with the bishop and the king and these four pawns here. The rook behind the past pawn is doing superb work, and he has targets as well. So this, this rook is truly superior to this rook, right? This rook has targets as well as a target. Have you noticed that? So the bishop, in a way, is kind of stuck there watching that pawn too. So all three of Bobby's pieces have to play defense. Ah, yeah. Let's see if there's something the great Fisher can do about this. Bishop f3, rook d6, rook e4. Notice the rook is free to go anywhere he wants. Notice the bishop is free to go anywhere he wants. Notice that? Just, just checking with you. And so, yes, take it. Yep, don't be babysitting that pawn too long, blockading it with the rook. He moved it up here, and now he's going to try to do something fancy and cool to trick Bobby into losing a rook, right? 
C. Rook E takes E7. Now Bobby's in trouble. Nope. Bishop will just simply take the rook. And the bishop will take the rook. And Bobby comes one step closer. But it's inevitable. He'll never be able to queen that pawn. And you see why. This is such a powerful illustration of this concept. This ought to drive the point home from now on. If at all possible, rooks belong behind past pawns, whether your own or your opponent's. It does not matter. And this is a very powerful illustration. Notice, too, now that the bishop is guarding that square, too. So that pawn's never making it. That's how this works. So he comes to uh, rook a8 check, and the king will come to g7, helping Bobby bring his king out, rook to a7, and now rook to d1. Is he giving up the pawn? Watch. Very interesting. Bishop's going to come back to f3 because he hit the target. Right? He's got the pawn safe for now because he hit the target. So Bobby's going to target hunt, hopefully in a way, to get this squirt off of the file so that he can get his squirt behind the pawn. That is what we're seeing happen. And now rook to e1. This will get interesting. King's going to come to g2. He's got to protect the backward pawn, right? Bishop will come to c5. Look at this. Now, I know the rook isn't threatening the pawn yet. Good centralization. Nice touch. Nice touch. It's really too bad He that king wasn't, yeah. You can see why the king moved in. So that would have been nice if Bobby could have got that, right? But he didn't. And now this is interesting. Rook a4. Rook a4. Bobby still got his pawn protected. Let's see what happens when... White rook a4. Rook goes to c1. He's going to keep in contact. Yeah. You want to try, this island is safe. He's not going to be attacked. Don't worry about that. You want to make sure everything's always covered. Don't leave anything uncovered if you can at all help it, right? So now we see the bishop going to try to come in here and manipulate some things. And now Bobby brings his king out, and that's got a question mark. Uh, and now... Now F4 comes to the front, and king is going to go to E6. Bobby's going to try to activate his king. Now, I have said you got to activate your king in the end game. Um, however, in this instance, it didn't quite work out for Bobby. Rook A6, check, king E7, drop the king back. G4, he's bringing up his forces. See, this is pretty much even Steven. Uh, if Bobby doesn't blow it, he's going to be able to get a draw. Let's hope he doesn't blow it. King is going to keep moving with the group. Yeah, don't leave the king back there for any reason. King moving with the group. This is good. This is good. Rook, of course, is going to go C3. Check. So he does come back down, trying to keep the king separate. Rook is going to stay here. He's got to keep his... Uh, pawn. He's got a target here. If that king moves off and bishop to oh, white bishop d5, acquiring a target here. Not hittable yet, but a target nonetheless. Rook b2 check. King f3. Rook h2. No, that's not going to work. King g3. Observe the usefulness of the king in protecting the pawns now. 
<laughs> the role is reversed. Isn't that interesting? Don't say kings aren't powerful and not useful in the end game. <laughs> now, instead of the pawns protecting the king, the king is protecting the pawns. I thought that was exquisitely interesting. King g3, and now, of course, work back to d2. Can't find a lot. Bishop's going to go to c4. Rook is going to go to c2. Bishop's going to go to d5. Bishop's going to go to d6. And because of the opposite colored bishops, and they're pretty even, Stephen, with the rooks, the bishop is not going to come off this file. That pawn has been stopped. Here they call it a draw. So interesting little game. And, and I left off a couple of the variations where Fisher didn't get a win because it was so long and convoluted. I don't know if Fisher would have seen that or not. It takes a grandmaster to see it. But for my purposes, showing this game, which is wonderful because it is an important illustration for beginners and intermediates are the main lessons. Be careful of the back rank checkmates. You notice neither king stayed on the back rank and they gave themselves an out. Both of them gave themselves a square to escape to because back ranks can happen overnight, man. I've had them happen to me. Every one of you guys have too. And the other root rule is rooks belong behind past pawns. This rook did become fairly active. And this rook didn't do a whole lot activity-wise, but it was very active because it prevented the queening of the pawn. And it was in Fisher's territory. So he had to bring his king forward to make sure he stayed in touch with the pawns and support the piece that is protecting the future queen, which is never going to make it. They recognize that, so they called it the draw. Even Stephen on the pawns won't work. So thank you for watching this Bobby Fisher game with me. I love doing these chess videos. We're working through Bobby Fisher. We're learning every game. We're learning something that's going to improve our games, and that is why we love this game, right? All right. Be good to all. Have fun. Make friends. Stay happy. Smile. It makes people wonder what you're doing. And in the meantime, I will catch you in the next Backyard Professor Chess video. Definitely and without question.